the SCAF gang rapes that shocked us all. Young Anglo women specifically targeted by a group of Middle Eastern teens raped and tortured for hours. But unbelievably, while behind bars, two of them had a relationship with a prison psychologist. She then married one and started a family with him. Tonight, we confront the woman who fell for a monster and hear from the judge who says he is still haunted by their horrific crimes. I thought what they did was worse than murder. Get them away, please. You've got to be joking, don't you? Well, it had all the hallmarks of a military exercise. Relationships with two of Australia's worst gang rapists. It's a gross abuse of position. That's a terrible thing that somebody would have to live so long and feel shut in by what had happened all those years ago. I think they were evil. It was extraordinarily callous. I was very troubled by it. It takes a special kind of monster to attract the longest ever sentence for a crime other than murder in Australia's history. Well, that creature has a name, Bilal Scaff, who led a gang of rapists on a campaign of violence and torture in the weeks leading up to the Sydney Olympics through parks like this one. What happened to random, innocent girls here and at other locations around the suburbs appalled a nation. Now, 17 years on, you'll be shocked at what's happened since. The woman behind the veil is Joanne Natalie Senior, an ex-criminal psychologist with a weakness for her clients. It is difficult to believe, but Joanne has fallen for the charms of not one, but two members of the SCAF gang, responsible for a chilling crime spree unlike anything else seen in Australia or perhaps the world. Orchestrated by their evil ringleader Bilal, up to 14 Middle Eastern youths, some too young to drink or vote, used mobile phones to organise their regular meetups, where they would lure girls from train stations and shopping centres into vehicles and toilet blocks. Awaiting them was an unimaginable ordeal of prolonged pack rape and bashings by a mob who mocked them for being Australian. Aussie pig, I'm gonna f you Leb style. One man who had to hear every horrifying detail, every nightmarish piece of evidence in a case that shook Australia was Judge Michael Fernane. It was a harrowing experience for him, one he says that affects him deeply to this day. He's never spoken on camera about it before, until now. Well, I found it extremely confronting. And it, <clears throat> it was... Uh, uh, I suppose crushing, almost, in a way. Now, I maintained a relatively stony face in the court, so no one could see I was affected by anything in particular. That's something I learnt to do over many years at the bar, you know, keep a, a sort of poker face so no one can guess what's going through your mind. District Court Judge Fernane presided over trials which stirred a frenzy of public fury not seen since the Anita Cobby murder. They uh, were involved in organised gang rape, something that I've never seen before. Organised gang rape using um, mobile phone technology to coordinate attacks. It was really quite astonishing. And each of those girls, in effect, has lost their life as a result of these attacks. That's the way I saw it. Particularly the girl in the third trial, I think. She was raped 44 times by 14 men in four hours. Now, I can't imagine she would have very much left after that. In handing down a historic sentence, Judge Fernane sent Bilal Scaff to jail for 55 years. He also threw the other members of the gang exactly where they belonged, behind bars. It's what happened there 
that has resurrected the agony and the outrage for anybody familiar with the gang rapes which paralyzed a city with fear. Jails are supposed to exist to punish criminals, keep the community safe, and to rehabilitate. But for two members of the most infamous rape gang in Australia's history, it was behind these prison walls that they came to find love. Joanne, Taylor Auerbach from The Current Affair. How are you going? Sister, are you OK? Get them away from me, please. You've got to be joking, don't you? Relationships with two of Australia's worst gang rapists is this a joke? Do you think that's an appropriate way for a psychologist working at a prison to behave? Joanne Senior took a wage from the taxpayer to run sex offender programs as a prison psychologist. While she was supposed to be counselling the rapists, she had phone sex with one, took on his last name and converted to Islam. When she was tired of him, she moved on to another member of the gang who is now on parole and living under the same roof. It's a gross abusive position. A psychologist is supposed to be to keep at arm's length from anyone they're attempting to assist. They should not engage in physical contact with them. They shouldn't become their friends. What she did went beyond what anybody could do, just ignored those rules and went into a personal relationship and then married a man. I mean, just, that's totally wrong. I've always wondered why a woman would go to a jail to, to tie herself up with a violent prisoner when the world is full of lonely men. Unlike during her therapy sessions at Parkley Prison, Joanne wasn't in the mood for a chat when we turned up. She bundled her kids, believed to be the children of one of the rapists, into the car of a stranger before driving off. Who's next, Joanne? You've worked your way through two of the gang. Do you know her? I don't know. There needs to be a full inquiry and investigation by Minister David Elliott as a result of this, uh, looking at the mechanisms in place. Are risk assessments working? Uh, mitigating the risks are important, and clearly in this example, uh, it hasn't worked. And people still feel that pain. Shadow Prisons Minister Guy Zangari is a father of four and appalled that two SCAF gang rapists have been allowed to take the New South Wales justice system for a ride. The victims themselves would expect that corrections would be containing and rehabilitating uh, the offenders, and yet we find out that they've been having a ball as a result of policies that are outdated and risk assessments that are not working in corrections in New South Wales. To fully appreciate just how wrong these prison flings are, you have to know some of what the men involved did to their victims. Sources close to the investigation have told a current affair that Bilal Scaff had returned feral after spending a year in Lebanon just prior to the rapes. With Bilal at the helm, the cowardly pack moved through Sydney looking for targets. On one occasion, they found two girls late night shopping in Chatswood. They lured them into a white van by offering them pot. Just imagine the fear and intimidation that crippled those poor girls as the men drove them across this bridge, hurling vile threats at them, hinting at the horror which lurked across Sydney Harbour. The first two girls, when they were raped out of Greenacre, not only were they raped, they were bashed, kicked, crash tackled, robbed of their jewellery and watches and mobile phones, and then threatened. If any of you, if you, either of you have got HIV or you've got uh, VD, we'll come and get you. And neither of them did. But imagine if you have that sort of threat ringing in your ears, you'd never forget it. What do you think motivated that group to act like they did? Well, that is what has always puzzled me, because none of them would ever say what motivated them in doing anything. It's secret, I don't know. Why do they pick these particular girls? For Michael Fernane, no other case in his life 
has affected him like the SCAF gang rape trials. The sheer terror of the evidence that he heard still haunts him. People, sometimes they walk into court, they see a judge and they go, oh, he's just sitting up there dozing away, nothing much. He doesn't have to do much, just sit there, doesn't have to do a thing, just sit and look and listen. But they don't know the inner turmoil. But I found it hard to sleep at times. You know, obviously affected by mood with other people. It was a very great strain, there's no doubt about it. Now retired as a judge and working in private practice, Michael Fernane QC keeps a folder of letters in his chambers. They are correspondence from admiring members of the public, strangers wanting to make their thanks known to the man who locked away the lowest criminal gang to ever pass before an Australian court. The sheer volume of these, do you think that tells you um, that this case struck at people's hearts because it could have been anybody, anybody's daughter? That's right, and particularly because some of them came from Queensland, some of them from South Australia, some from Victoria, some from New South Wales, and then this one from a building site in New Zealand. It was pretty amazing. <clears throat> I didn't realise it would get such incredible publicity. I just had no idea. I now feel I can put my own At the top of the pile is a letter from a middle-aged woman who herself was gang raped at the age of 15. I feel as though some sort of justice has been awarded to me via those women for what happened to me all those years ago. I only wish I was brave enough to speak up 30 years ago but now I feel as if I can start a life and be able to have and find some peace of mind. Again, I just want to say a very big thank you on behalf of myself and all the other silent rape victims. Thank you for giving us some hope. Now, I found that very touching. I must say, I did. With the pain of what happened to those girls here at the turn of the century still etched in his mind, the nagging question for Michael Fernane is if he could go back in time, would he take on that infamous trial once again? I think I would. Someone has to do it who's prepared to run a trial properly and, if necessary, impose a tough sentence. And I was prepared to do it. Late today, Joanne Senior's lawyer sent us a statement which you can read on our website.